will shout and sing. I will know my Savior by the mark where the nails have been. By the mark. seeing the tent go up. I like it when we have a really good crew to help put the tent up. Yeah, yeah. Amen. I remember some lean years when it was me and Steve and Mary were sledgehammers. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mary did all the cooking. <laughs> and me and Steve and her were all three pretty exhausted by the end of the week. But oh, God, God has grown their ministry in such a great way. It's been so uh, good to be a part of them. We figured out that this June or July, I can't remember exactly what June or July when we were in Silverton, in 1992, 31 years ago this summer, we met, yeah. and we've worked together hundreds of times over the years since then, at least a hundred times, I think, probably sometimes eight or ten times a year, at least three or four times a year, every year since then, so it's always good to be here and be with them. I uh, I would like for us, we're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures. I don't have just a one scripture we're going to base on this morning. I, I like to preach from a scripture, and then I'll go to a bunch of them to make the points that need to be made, but today I want us to look at an idea or a thought and, and go where the Word of God takes us when we look at that idea or that thought. Um, I, I know many of you have probably been following or have heard um, of the different pockets, for lack of a better term, of revival yeah. that are beginning around our country Amen. that have shown up in different places. Yeah. Um, we are embarking on a week of revival meetings here at Amato Baptist Church. That's right. And we are calling people to revival. First and foremost, revival um, can be a lot of different things uh, outside yeah. of its actual definition. I mean, we can make revival about whatever we want it to be uh, in the realm of how we do church meetings and things like that. And a lot of times people have evangelistic meetings where uh, they're out in the in the uh, highways and byways of the town reaching lost people. And you see hundreds of lost people get saved. Billy Graham, 
uh, spent his entire adult life preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ so that lost people would be saved. But, but that is not revival. That is evangelism. Right. And so when a church embarks on revival, <coughs> what we're talking about is people coming back to a relationship Amen. with the Lord that is more vibrant than it has evidently been at some time. Amen. The actual definition of revival is for something to become more vital and important again. Yeah. The word again is in Webster's Dictionary about the word revival. What that means is something in our life, something in our walk with the Lord at some point as individuals or as the body of Christ, those things that are important have become less important to us. They become less vital to us. They have become something that we've put on the back burner. I would say at the outset, the Lord has not called us to show up for church on Sunday morning. He has called us to a radical change of our lives. Yes. Unfortunately, we might be radically changed at the time of our salvation, but then when the world comes closing in and we become busy in our lives, those things change. And so many things get put on the back burner. I've often been intrigued and just baffled by the scripture verse. After Mary and Joseph searching for three days, finally find Jesus in the temple. And he says to them, did you know I had to be about my father's business? And my paraphrase, basically, they had no clue what he was talking about. And I'm like, seriously? Seriously? You forget when that angel came in the window of your room at night and woke you and told you you were going to be the mother of Jesus? How do you forget that? But over time, being a mother to other small children, being the father that is building a career and a job, the world closes that in on you and pushes those important things to the side. I've said for several weeks in my message that I post that we are going to have to be a people that somehow, some way, and I have not exactly figured out how this is going to happen, but we have got to do this. We have got to divest ourselves from the current culture and society that we live in in some way and still, however that has to happen, fulfill the Great Commission. Yeah. That is not going to be an easy thing to do because we have to live in the world but be not of the world. Right. But somehow we have got to continue to fulfill the Great Commission and yet still stop being a part of this craziness yeah. that is going on in this world. If we do not do that, we will never have revival because we will be too caught up in that stuff, directly or indirectly. When we see revivals like that that started at Asbury, the, the university in Kentucky, and then sprung to other schools, Texas A&M has had a huge uh, blowing up of the, the power of God in the student life on that campus. Right? Yeah. I saw a video the other day that on literally on Muscle Beach, Venice, California, there were college students out there preaching and singing praise and worship. And there were hippies, bodybuilders, uh, bikini-clad skateboarders and surfers falling on their knees and on their face on the beach before Christ, getting saved and college students leading them to Jesus Christ. Yeah, Folks, God is still in the miracle business. Amen. 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 And there are those that believe that because the apostles died, miracles don't happen anymore. Let me tell you something. We may not be able to do some of the things that the apostles did. We were not in the presence of Jesus in the physical form of his body as they were. But if God did miracles then, God can do miracles now because God can do whatever he wants to do. And you know what? He's not going to ask our permission. He's not going to believe or ask if we think it's okay or not. He's going to do what he chooses to do. That is the sovereignty of God. Now, he gives us choice. He gives us the opportunity to choose him or not. We can choose sin if we want to. But the only reason we're able to have that choice is because he is sovereign. He allowed that or it would never have happened. So when we look at all of these things that are going on around the country, we hear everything from praise the Lord to, well, I don't know about all that. <laughs> and everything in between. Not unlike what the disciples heard 
That's right. When the power of the Holy Spirit blew in the windows of the upper room and changed everyone there. Not only that, but it is my contention that at that very moment, it began as the catalyst that changed the world. Because at that moment, it went from being a man who preached to his disciples and gave his life on a cross to a cult-like little group of people to literally the changing of the world. We count our calendar <laughs> according to the birth and life of Jesus Christ. That's right. We live in a world that is laid out for us based on the life of Jesus Christ. That moment changed the world. And it changed the world because those men began to preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ in boldness and, and in power that they did not have before that moment. Before that moment, they were running for the high country scared for their lives. But it was the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that changed everything. Right. Jesus lived on this earth and he knew he had to ascend to the Father and so he left us what he called a helper. And that was the Holy Spirit. I will say this before I get into the other that I'd like to talk about this morning without, I try not to talk too much before I get into the meat of what I'm trying to talk about and run out of time. God the Father will never do something that Jesus the Son or the Holy Spirit would not do. They may not all do the same things. They may not all manifest themselves in the world and in our lives identically, but they would. one thing they would not do is something the others would not. If there is something out there that Jesus would not do because he is Jesus, God wouldn't do it either, the Father. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't do it either. They are one. They're going to work together. And the things that they do are going to be congruent. So what the Holy Spirit does for us is that which Jesus would have done for us. What he would have to be done for us. That's why he sent us the helper. That it would continue here after he was gone. Do not be mistaken. He is here with us. Even though he is at the right hand of his father. Interceding for us. And so we look at these things that are going on and we see that there are different reactions to when revival happens. Just a few years ago, seems like yesterday sometimes, it's actually a long time ago, I was in college and a great revival broke out on the campus where I was a student Good. and it lasted weeks. Sometime between then and now, at that same college, it broke out again. <laughs> same, same kind of thing. It lasted for weeks. Very, very similar to the Asbury situation. And it ran its course. It began to go, but the, the results of that lasted for a long, long time. Amen. Both of those times. Yes. So this is nothing new that has never happened before. Every great awakening in the history of mankind started with young people praying and getting on their face in repentance before God. Every great awakening, they did not begin with the great Spurgeons and those people. They were the catalyst to keep it going and they were the, the most uh, it, uh, obvious thing that people saw was their great preaching. But those things began literally with young people saying, you know what? We want something different. We want something more. And we believe God has more for us than what we are living. And they fell on their face in repentance. I listened to the sermon at Asbury that started the whole thing. And though it was a great sermon, it was not one of these things that you think would shape the earth. This young man did a great job. But it's not, it was not rocket science. It's stuff that great men of God have been preaching for centuries. But that Amen. shows you the power and the simplicity of the word of God. Yes. He just spoke about sin and repentance in Jesus Christ. And people literally were transformed and they fell on their faces saying, Oh my goodness, how have I been living? And they came to repentance. And that started everything. But the reactions have been all over the map. I want to talk to you today not about revival and how we get revival to happen. Because let me tell you something. Those folks at Ashbury are proof that we can't make revival happen. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes God just moves and we're not even expecting it. Right. <laughs> we do have to be prepared in our hearts for God to move. We have to be willing that he would move in our life because he's not going to force anything on us. Right. But there are times when he's going to sneak up on us and go, bam, and we're going to go, wow, look what happened. But I would like to talk to you today about things that we can avoid that will hinder revival. We do a whole lot in this country, even within some of our churches, that hinder revival from happening. Yep. <laughs> and we need to stop it. Yes. We need to get out of the way and let God work. That young man that preached that great message that day, he just preached what God laid on his heart and then he got out of the way. And literally for weeks, the lives of faculty and staff and students and even people like you and me across this whole country have been changed. Even some celebrities have said, wow, there is something to that and I want some of it. And so we need to be people that will not hinder revival. I heard a story just this last week. Just the other day, people came to their pastor. The elderly gentleman came to his pastor and said, why don't we ever have revival? We need to have revival in this church. The pastor said, well, if we did, only you old people would be the only people to come. Just beat down the spirit of that man. Yeah. That's a hindrance to revival. That's right. I would venture to say that if that church did have revival meetings, Revival would not come while that man was still the pastor of that church until he got right. That's right. Because he is not right. Why would he even say such a thing? If only four or five old people showed up and were transformed by the power of the Spirit of God, would that not be good? Yes. yes. So first and foremost, the main thing that I think hinders revival is our frame of mind. We do not have a frame of mind that is set up or ready for revival by and large. Now listen, do not mistake. I'm not speaking to you directly, all right? I'm not calling you out as people in this room and saying you're doing these things because you are one of the few churches that still even has revival. That's the hardest thing in the world to do is to find churches that will still have revival in its deep. I mean, we see this all the time. They don't even want to have revival meetings. And so it, it begins with a frame of mind. There is fear and apathy and skepticism or lack of understanding in people's minds about what revival is, should be, or how it comes that keeps them from doing what they need to do to allow revival to come in their own life, much less in the life of their church. There's a line in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, when, when Mr. Potter is offering this great opportunity to George Bailey, which you know as well as I do if you've ever seen the movie, as an ulterior motive to get him under his control, because he can't control him. And George Bailey says, well, I don't know if I want to do this. He said, what's wrong with you, son? Are you afraid of success? Listen, some people are afraid of success. Yeah. And they'll shoot their self in the foot every time they start getting successful somehow. Because success has a cost. And it may cost you more than you believe it is worth. It's not always bad to be afraid of success. Because there are times when success might mean one thing, but it would mean something completely different in another area. There have been opportunities we have had that by the world standards were success. I mean financial and every other way. But when we sat back and looked at it and weighed the cost, we said, nah, I don't think we want to do that. And so that mindset that is skeptical, we're skeptical people, aren't we? I mean, when we see, you see something online, some magic trick, some guy does go, oh, wait a minute, I don't believe that. Somebody photoshopped that. That's not really happening because we are skeptical people. So when revival breaks out because so many have never seen such a thing, yes. we become skeptical because we don't understand it. Listen, if I'd been standing there at Pentecost, I'd have been freaked out too, let me tell you. <laughs> I'd have been saying, whoa, well, them guys been drinking? You know, just like the people did. They said, these guys must have been drinking. How they been drinking is early. I never did understand that either. 
<laughs> Drinking okay late in the afternoon, but it's not in the morning. I mean, it's, or, or it's vice versa. It's bad, it's bad, isn't it? I mean, I, there you go. I laughed when they said during the COVID thing, <laughs> bars couldn't be open past 10 o'clock at night. So evidently, you could only catch COVID up until 10 o'clock. <laughs> or after 10 o'clock. Up until 10 o'clock, you were immune. As soon as 10 o'clock came, buddy, you could catch COVID if you were in that bar. You better get out of there. I would have been just like those people. I would have said, man, it's early in the day for them to be drinking. <laughs> we're skeptical people. And so our frame of mind is a powerful uh, hindrance to revival if we're not careful. In 2 Timothy 1.7 2 Timothy 1 7, it says this. For God hath not given, hath given us the spirit, have not, let me read this right, I gotta get tongue tight. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. You know what that sound mind means? It means common sense. And you know where common sense comes from? It is an inalienable right, just like the power that God gives us for rights and privileges that God gave us that we've determined in the Declaration of Independence we have. Man doesn't give us the right to certain things. God gave us those things. God gave us a sound mind. If we will follow his will and follow what he tells us and follow what his Holy Spirit speaks to us, we can think with common sense about spiritual things. He didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us power. Man, power, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. Power can be a terrible thing if it's not used with the will of God. But this is saying that within the will of God, there is power and love and a sound mind. Yeah. So when we begin to be skeptical, we are going around the power and the love and the sound mind <coughs> Grabbing hold of fear. We don't understand. We don't know. Revelation 3, 16. He, Jesus, uh, uh, the, the Spirit of God speaking to John in the vision about the churches. Talking about the, the seven churches. He says, you're lukewarm. It's my paraphrase. But you're lukewarm. And if you're lukewarm, you're not hot. You're not cold. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's right. I laugh these days because they, they have all these warnings. You know, you shouldn't do this. shouldn't do that. <laughs> Man, we used to ride in the back of a pickup without any kind of restraint. We didn't ever have a seatbelt on. And we used to drink out of a garden hose, and I survived it. But you know what? Unless you were really, really hot and thirsty, that water out of that garden hose was just plum nasty, wasn't it? Not because it didn't taste good, because it just looked warm. You know, put a lot of hot water in coffee, that didn't bother us, do it? Tea or whatever. We get ice cold water, and boy, that's good stuff. Yeah. But that lukewarm water, sometimes you got to get used to that. It's just different. I'm not talking about a, a bottle of water that's just sitting on the counter in your kitchen. That tastes pretty good. But if it's been sitting in the seat of your truck for a little while and you drink it, it's just a little <laughs> bit warm. I, I don't get a whole lot of enjoyment from that. And if I'm desperately thirsty, I may swallow it anyway. But God says, if we spiritually are lukewarm, he spews us out. He would rather, this is even worse to me. He would rather us be completely cold yeah. spiritually than to be lukewarm. You know what that tells me? It's not the lost world that hinders revival. It's us. That's right. You know? Yes. Because we're saved, theoretically, supposedly, but we don't act like it. In Hebrews eleven six, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, if you're skeptical, is that not a lack of faith when it comes to spiritual matters? We need, sometimes we just need to say, okay, look, I don't understand what's going on up there. I don't understand what's going on on all these college campuses. I do not understand at all what went on at Pentecost. But you know what? I'm going to trust God because he understands what's going on at those places. Yeah. So I tell you what, when I don't have understanding, where my understanding stops, I'm going to let his pick up and carry on. Yeah. That's what my faith is going to do. And without that, God's word says this is impossible to please God. I don't know about you. I don't care if I please people anymore. I'm getting too old to care if I please people. 
Really? But I'll tell you what, I want to please God. Amen. Because when it comes right down to it, I don't answer to people. Amen. But I will answer to God. Amen. James 1, 5, it says, pray for wisdom. It's the one thing God will give you in abundance if you pray for it. So if you see these things happening, when you see revival happening, rather than letting your frame of mind be a hindrance to revival, Remember your spirit of power, love, a sound mind, not fear. Remember not to be lukewarm and just, well, I'm going to wait and sit back and see what goes on with all this. <laughs> Remember to have faith. If you don't understand, pray for wisdom. Say, God, give me wisdom. Because let me tell you something, folks. There have been some false things happening over the histories of this world. There's people today in pulpits all over this country preaching false doctrine. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's people preaching stuff that is absolute heresy. Mm -hmm. Everything from the way you give to literally how you get saved mm -hmm. and what it means to be saved. That's right. We need wisdom. Yes. So we need to be constantly, constantly, constantly praying for wisdom, for power and love, and for a sound mind. I think number two, one very, very, maybe, uh, these are not in any order of relevance or importance, all right? These points I'm making, all right? So don't think that because this is number two that it's less important than your frame of mind or that it's more important than your frame of mind. It's just here, all right? I think in some cases we have extremely poor leadership. As I said before, I am not talking about here. These guys, your pastor, he wants people to get saved. He does not want that anyone should perish, but all would come to repentance. Amen. If that was not the case, he would risk his life going to Mexico for years. He would risk his life living down here on the border that is virtually a war zone at times. And you people who live here know what I'm talking about. Those people up there in the Northeast that live in their ivory palaces in Washington, they have no clue what people living down here on the border are going through. Nor do they care. So people here in this place would not have revival meetings year after year after year if they were not concerned for the life, the spirit, the soul, and the eternal salvation of lost people all around here. Amen. Not to mention your daily walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. So I am not talking about you guys. I'm talking about people in general. There are churches in general. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about because I'm on the phone every day almost with people that are having struggles with leadership in the church. Sometimes it's the pastor and sometimes it's the pastor being literally put on a spit and burnt at the stake by the other people in leadership in their church. First Timothy 3, 2 says that a man who is in leadership, again, I'm paraphrasing for time's sake, should be blameless, it says. That word blameless means above reproach. You know what above reproach means? It means that there should not even be an appearance that there's something wrong going on. I'm not saying that there's something going wrong. I'm saying there should not even be the appearance that there is. Yeah. You should do everything you can to avoid that even it looks like to anybody that you're doing something wrong. Go out of your way to make sure that nobody thinks there's anything untoward. If you're in leadership, and I'm not just talking about the pastors, I'm talking about deacons and elders and everything else. Some of these elder elder led churches need to have a clearing house and get rid of some of their elders. Because <laughs> they got some elders that are not only not qualified to be an elder, I'm not sure they're saved. Some of the things they're putting their pastor through, some of the things that they're doing in their church. We've got to avoid the, even the appearance of wrongdoing. Some in our leadership positions are just lazy. They know that if a whole bunch of people start coming, a whole bunch of people start getting saved, that's going to make their job tougher. It's going to make your job harder because you're going to have more people you got to visit. You're going to have more people you got to counsel with. Then their families start getting saved and you got to deal with them. Listen, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it is. But some people just think it's a pain. And those people need to resign as pastor and let someone be a pastor who is called to be a pastor. Yeah, that's right. 
that won't look at that as a pain, but will look at it as a blessing from God. And those elders that are giving their pastors grief because of the kind of people they're bringing in and seeing getting saved and baptized, they're not our kind of people. They need to fall on their face before God and ask for repentance. That God would not strike them dead and swallow them into a hole in the ground like he did some people in the Old Testament. Because those men, I don't care who they are, I don't care how they were qualified to be an elder according to that church's rules, they need to be taken out one way or another. Let God do it. But we need to pray that it be done. That God either takes them out or changes them. Because those people are not only a hindrance to the work of that church, they are a hindrance to the revival. Matthew 7. 21. It says this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Let me tell you something, folks. The will of our Father in heaven is not for us to have big, beautiful buildings with fountains out front. The will of our Father in heaven is not for us to have really cool covered roping arenas where we can have get-togethers out there and rope the cattle. The will of our Father in heaven is not that we have big, beautiful hospitals and children's homes and schools and universities and all of those things. Listen, if those things are making disciples, then that's fantastic. But if they're not making disciples, we are wasting God's time, God's money, and all of our efforts. Amen. Because that is not going to get anybody into the kingdom of heaven. I went to that rope and every Tuesday night, that cowboy church. God's got to let me into heaven. No, actually, he doesn't. Because your roping number with USTRC means nothing to him. Neither does how fancy the lights on your arena are. And if you are a person who is in any shape, form, or fashion, negative about lost people being saved or Christians falling on their face before God and getting right. You're the problem. You're the hindrance to revival. Yep. Not this stuff going on that you're not liking. Yep. There's a whole lot of people, unfortunately, and I think that because they changed the light bulbs at the church every time they went out, they're the one that drove the bus for the teenagers to go to Six Flags every summer. They were in church every Sunday, taught Sunday school for 40 years. That God's going to say, well, let's just look at his resume. Isn't he a good Sunday school teacher? Let's let him in. It's going to have nothing to do with any of that. Those are symptoms to the cause. The cause is Jesus Christ. Amen. It will only be based on your salvation experience through Jesus Christ. That's all it's based on, not your efforts. You are made for those good works. The Bible tells us that over and over again. Beforehand, he prepared good works for us to do once we're saved. But it's not those good works that gets us saved. Right. I think there's sometimes when People are power hungry. And that keeps us from allowing revival, allowing revival to work in our own lives, if not in the lives of the entire church. Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, others better than themselves. We should not be doing anything if the only reason we're doing it is because it benefits us. My wife tells people all the time when they say, well, I just don't like the music down there. She said, well, you know what? Maybe that music isn't meant to minister to you. Maybe it's meant to minister to the person sitting next to you. <laughs> Unfortunately, folks, when we walk into worship on Sunday mornings, for somehow, some way, we've been conditioned to think that that's about us. And that's for us. And it should be something we enjoy and have fun doing and a great thing. Folks, this hour of worship, if that's the best we can do, which it shouldn't be, we should be in worship 
all the time. In fact, as a Christian, everything we do ought to be worship, really. Because everything we do, it says, should be done to the glory of God. But if we come to 11 to noon worship on Sunday mornings thinking, wow me, you just will stay home. What's bonanza? <laughs> because it's not about you. It is about God. Amen. The almighty father of all creation. And when we come into worship, it needs to be completely about him. Not about our own vain glory. But in lowliness of mind. What did Jesus say? The first will be last and the last shall be first. We shouldn't be doing things just for our benefit. I told a bunch of elementary school kids several times over the last couple of years doing school assemblies. Not allowed to say a lot of things in public school, but I said this. You know, I think it's going to be better for you in your life, these little kids, if you will think about this. Always treat others the way you want them to treat you. Amen. I'm not saying treat them the way they do treat you, but sometimes they don't treat you very well. But forget how they actually treat you and treat them the way you want them to treat you regardless. I told them, I said, you know what? I don't trust the people running this country. But if you'll start at third or fourth grade where you are now and you'll love other people the way you want to be loved and you'll treat other people the way you want to be treated, when you get that old, I'll trust you to run this country. We need to put others first. We need a pastor and our leadership needs to follow the command of God to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All that other stuff is going to take care of itself. Right? I believe besides those things that lead to us passing off on our own agendas and not the agenda of God, we have a carnality or a lack of repentance. Yes, within the church. Yeah. See, revival doesn't come as a first thing. Salvation comes as a first thing. Right. Revival comes when those things that, that brought us to salvation and that were important to us at first wane in importance. Revival is a bringing it back. So if you are a person who is lost out in the world, who's always lived in sin, you're not the problem with revival. Because you've never had it in the first place. It's those of us who have had it who have known the salvation of Christ, God's word says, and have turned off, as it says in Romans 1. It, Romans 1 is not talking about those lost, uh, sorry reprobates out there that are doing all the terrible things that they'll do in Hollywood and on the Grammy Awards and all these ungodly things that are going on. The outright, overt, uh, blatant worship of Satan that is going on in the entertainment industry right now is ungodly and, un and disgusting. The worship of even pedophilia in our country has gotten to epidemic proportions. And yet, that's not the reason revival is not happening, folks. The devil's got them. He wants us. Romans 1 is not talking about those people. Romans 1 is talking about you and me. We know the truth. We understand the truth. But you know what? All that stuff we talked about that closes in from the world makes the lie look better. So we just swap it out. And we know that many of those people are really saved and they'll never lose their salvation even though they will never do a thing for the word of God, or for the power of God, or for the kingdom of God. But there are a bunch of those that are what Matthew 7 would consider self-deceived people. They think they're saved, but they're really not. Right. And so they know the truth, but they've not accepted it. You know, there's a fine line when it comes to salvation. There you go. Confessing with your mouth, it doesn't end right there. You can say anything. But believing in your heart is where you cross that line. In Muslim countries, they may not kill you if you start going to a church. But it's a Christian church, Baptist church or whatever. But you get baptized, they'll kill you and they'll kill your whole family. You know why? Because baptism to them is sometimes more important than it is to us. <laughs> it proves to the whole world, I mean business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm not just going to church. I mean business. I'm going to follow him in baptism to show the whole world that I am dead to sin, raised back in a new life, and walking with Jesus. Yeah. That's what it means. Jesus died, buried, resurrected, and we can do the same thing spiritually by accepting him as our Lord and Savior. When that happens, a Muslim community will kill you. Our carnality that is crept within the church is the problem, not the lost world. Romans 12, 1 and 2 deals with this, and we have talked about this so many times. If you've been in church very much in your life, you have gone through these passages. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God. I love the word beseech because you know what it means? It's one of those loaded words. It means I'm begging you, but I'm telling you, you don't have a choice. <laughs> that's like backwards of itself. You can't beg somebody and give them no choice. But that's what beseech means. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable, folks, that he would ask us that. And yet we're living like the world. We're partnering our bodies and our soul with the world. God's word says that puts us at enmity with God, which means we are against him. And then he says, but be not conformed. The original language actually lends us to think that he's saying, stop being conformed to the world. <laughs> he knew they already were. Yeah. And he's saying, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Folks, we know what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And it's about time we got about it. That's when revival comes. We rely on our own power and our own ability instead of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. There are so many passages of Scripture about the power of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and changing us. But I am reminded of a couple of passages that I want us to wrap up this with. Jeremiah 23 1 says this. I'm sorry, I'm about to go over. I'm sorry, but I'm going to. That's all right. It says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastures, saith the Lord. Yeah. Anytime you see the word woe, you better be careful. That literally, in their vernacular of the Hebrew culture, the day these were written, was the worst thing someone could say. It's like be accursed. Woe unto those, and, and, and there's, there's all kinds of debate about if that word pastor means what we would call a pastor, or if it means like James talks about the one who would choose to be a teacher. That really means anyone in authority directing and instructing others. It could mean that very well. But if we are going to be an example to others as Christians, yeah. woe unto us if we lead them astray. That's what it's saying. And then it says in Matthew 5, 6, in the Beatitudes, and I'll paraphrase it again, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled I want to be filled with righteousness I need to hunger and thirst for righteousness so lastly the thing that hinders revival more than anything I believe in our churches we're not hungry we're not thirsty we've lived in a land of milk and honey even the manna from heaven is mundane to us. The quail drop in the desert while we are starving means nothing to us anymore. The water flowing from the rock that we might not die of thirst in the desert means nothing to us. And the serpent raised on the rod in the air that we might look to for salvation in light of the poisonous snakes biting us and killing us <coughs> in the desert it means nothing to us. Jesus said if I be lifted up like the serpent was in the desert I'll draw all people unto myself. That's right. The bottom line is this folks if Christians get right lost people get saved. <laughs> I'm calling you today to get right. We've got a few days here where we're having meetings 
And it needs to be the beginning, not the whole, but only the beginning of us getting right. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the opportunity to open your word, read from your word, study your word. Lord, make us hunger, thirst for your righteousness that we might be filled. Lord, bless these days, bless this place, bless this crown. That your Holy Spirit would move with his power and his presence on us, even beyond our understanding. But Lord, that you would give us wisdom, power, love, and a sound mind to follow the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.